with us here today to talk about how to turn fear to our advantage is Dr. Sheila Keegan. Um, some of you may know her from uh, Campbell Keegan, um, a consultancy that they set up in 1983 where they help clients enable, communicate, and lead organizational change. Um, others of you may have seen her photography, which uh, we discovered um, in, in publications as diverse as OK Magazine and uh, the British Journal of Photography. Um, and of course, she's a regular speaker on TV and radio. Um, who better to talk, talk to us about fear? Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Interesting coming after Wayne, because he's talking about happiness largely, and I'm talking about fear. And you could say, well, you know, in a sense, these are sort of um, opposite ends of the, the, the spectrum. Um, but all, both of them are relevant to all of us most of the time, in fact. Um, so I'm going to talk about fear, how it, it worms its way into us in all sorts of ways, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with on a personal basis, um, how it can debilitate us, how the negative um, effect of fear can, can just make us close up. And, and uh, in terms of innovation, clearly that's a, it can be quite an inhibitor. So I want to sort of talk about fear in a sort of broad sense and then, then look at it in terms of how we might be able to either get round it or through it or feel the fear and do it, do it anyway um, in terms of innovation. So this is, this is not about how to do it. I'm not talking about how to do it. It's more of a sort of... Um, I guess it's more like an AA meeting um, in the sense that we've all been there. We all understand fear. Um, and we've all sort of done our best to circumnavigate or, or, or um, kill it or, or whatever. Um, hopefully you'll disagree with, with stuff that I'm saying um, and that, that this will continue through the, through the day in our conversations. Right, fear, anger, frustration. It's a strange topic for a, a marketing conference, isn't it? Because marketers are supposed to be sort of enthusiastic and forward-looking, um, no, no fear here, in a sense. Um, how, how many of you, would you say, in the last couple of weeks have felt some sort of fear or anxiety in, in the workplace? Just put your hands up. Right, that's almost everybody. Um, and how many of you haven't? Good, so they're the ones who are really frightened. <laughs> OK, great. Um, I mean, none of us can escape fear, really. It's, it's, it's part of the human condition. Um, and particularly since the 2008 crash, I think for all of us, it's, it's, been, it's permeated life in lots of ways. Um, and fear, there's fear in all sorts of ways. Like, so fear of loss of control, loss of prestige. It's fear of redundancy. Um, or fear of the unknown, which is, is a fairly dominant one at the moment, because... None of us, including our government or our finances or whatever, seem to know what's going to happen really in the future. But it often masquerades in all, as all sorts of things. Um, when people are frightened, they often appear angry, they often appear uh, frustrated. There's a lot of passing the buck. It isn't my responsibility, it's somebody else, somebody else's. So fear comes out in all sorts of, sorts of ways. And I wanted to talk a bit about... Um, to start off saying, well, you know, what is fear and, and how, does, how does it affect us? Because it's a bit of a dirty word, isn't it, really? I mean, none of us want to admit that we're frightened or um, that, that, you know, we, we don't want to ad address something. It's, it's, we're in the, the business of spin and persuasion, so it seems wrong to be even considering fear, if you like. Um, and in the days when we had the, were chased by woolly mammoths or, or foxes, as in this case, it's, fear is a, uh, clearly a very useful emotion. But what about today? Um, you know, where, why do, where does fear fit in anymore? I mean, when we're under threat, um, chemicals such as adrenaline and, and, and cortisol are released into the bloodstream. Um, and these trigger all sorts of responses in us. We have rapid heart rate, we have increased blood pressure, elevated glucose in the blood, redistribution of blood to the muscles, dilation of the pupils. I mean, extraordinary stuff, actually. And this enables us to respond quickly, to have clearer vision, uh, more energy, more strength. Uh, make quick decisions, um, and what's not to like about that? So, in a sense, fear is a very, very useful um, emotion. But where is it in the 21st century? I mean, there aren't many woolly mammoths around at the moment, so we have to sort of make the best we can without them, really. Uh, we wouldn't want to lose that fight-or-flight instinct, because it's invaluable at, in times of danger. Um, and fear has evolved, really, to fit in with our contemporary lifestyles. 
Uh, we've all, as I said, feel that, um, know the phrase, feel the fear and do it anyway. And we remember the times when we were anxious and had to do a, you know, an event or whatever, and you get through it and that feeling of, yeah, I've, I've done it. Um, and so this, this, what seems to be happening in the 21st century is that fear has become sort of generalized in that way. So we can fear, feel fearful about things that really we shouldn't be frightened about at all, or, or, or we have a disproportionate fear about things. Um, for example, the, the, we're afraid of often uh, spiders, we can be afraid of, afraid of blood or the outdoors. Actually being tickled by feathers is, is, is apparently quite a, a common fear. It's called uh, pterophobia, <laughs> in case you needed to know. Um, we fear things that may not happen, and this, this tends to make us really quite risk averse. So nowadays, fear is as much in our heads as it is outside of it. And then we go on to fear in organizations, which I think from people's ex um, responses earlier is, is, is fairly widespread. Um, and the last five years have been a bit of a, a sort of bear pit in many organizations. Um, and I accept not all, but in, in many that I've worked in or, or had experience of. And the economic downturn has affected all of us to, to different degrees. The collapse of companies, the fabric of our lives have changed, redundancy, short-term short working, all the rest of it. And even when there isn't um, job risk, people are frightened of the, the future quite often, fear, fear of the unknown. And there's some, a lot of interesting stuff in the literature about how people feel in organizations. And I pulled out two things I'll come back to, but I, I find really interesting. The one is that trust is vital for healthy, productive organizations. Now, we could spend all day talking about what we mean by trust, but I'll, I'll assume it's the sort of everyday sense in which we mean it. So trust is vital for healthy, um, productive organizations. But trust in organizations and leaders is at an all-time low. And that's, that's a real issue and a real problem for us, because... On the one hand, we're saying we need trust, we haven't got it, and yet we'd like people to go out and innovate. And what does innovate need? It needs um, energy, it needs confidence, it needs to be, you need to be risk, take, available to take risk, to deal with failure. So it, it just doesn't stack up, and somehow we have to change that balance, those three prongs, if you like, in some way that it does work, because until we do, we're going to be stuck. Um, and what, well, you know, what happens to people in, in organizations? They feel frustrated, they feel powerless, they feel lack of, a lack of control in their lives. Um, often there's a fear of, of, of um, uh, there's bullying within organizations, marginalization, a sense of, of threat. Um, this can be in particular departments, it can be throughout the organization. And that, that tends to, to in, in psychological terms, it tends to make us move back to a childlike sort of posture so we tend to regress, we feel childlike, we don't want to take responsibility. Why would you, you know, in a, in a situation where if you put your head above the parapet, you might get shot. So people tend to close in and close down. We avoid risk. Organizations can get frozen. Uh, and clearly that's not, uh, not good for a, a culture of, um, of innovation. There's a sort of school, a whiff of the schoolyard about all of this. You know, so who's friends with whom and, and uh, sort of hiding away from, from things. Um, a sense of alienation, you know, going back to um, this, this sense of, of, of not belonging or being, being separate from other people. Um, and a need, there's a tendency to blend in. If you, if you were, don't want to stand out from the crowd and be accused of anything, um, the best thing to do is to sort of just, just blend in, really. Um, you, you think of that all this... Um, Oh, I lost my pages in a bit. Talk amongst yourself. Um, yeah, it, I think in, in organisations as well, there's a sense that there's more and more communication. We get more and more communication from management, between departments. We're constant, the constant email sort of a uh, treadmill, if you like. And you'd think that with more um, communication, there'd be more understanding. Ironically, that often seems to be the different. Many of us don't, dis, don't trust the communications that we do get, a sense of, of existential loneliness, if you like, at work. And it's interesting to go back to some of the psychologists of the 50s 
um, who were talking more about human values at the time. So Abraham um, Maslow, his self-actualization, the hierarchy of needs that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, Carl Rogers and his uh, iconic book on, on becoming a person. And what they're saying basically is we all need to feel needed to contribute, to grow. Um, if we want a productive, innovative workforce, something has seriously got to change. So we have really, in many cases, got a sort of quite a, a toxic environment with which we're working. Um, it prevents healthy functioning, normal growth, the ability of individuals to thrive and to flourish. And there are lots of studies that, that illustrate this. I picked out one which I thought was particularly interesting because it's perhaps the largest. And this is the Tower Watson's Global Workshop Study in 2010. And they covered 20,000 employees over 22 countries, so a significant study. And what they described was a, a, a recession-battered workforce, increased anxiety, heightened desire for security, job mobility at a long time low, and a disturbing, which was their word, a disturbing lack of confidence in leaders and managers. So this bizarre picture is, is emerging again of trust in organizations being necessary, um, at an all-time low, and yet we want people to, to innovate, to experiment, to go, go the extra mile when they're, they're, they're scared stiff. So what happens with fear? Um, fear is very closely associated, in psychological terms, it's very closely associated um, with control and a need for control. And I think, you know, when we're... I mean, a silly example, but we're about to go on holiday and we're thinking, have I got my passport? Have I got this? Have I got that? And you, you go back and you try and find it again. You double check. And this is all a, a way of trying to control things so you feel safer. And it's, it's no different in organizations, really. There's, there's a sense that how can, we, um, how can we get rid of this fear? Oh, yes, let's control it. Let's Im impose more restrictions on employees or on ourselves or in the way we work. Um, so it, it fear breeds that need for control. <coughs> and in organizational climates of fear, the employees from the CEO downwards or upwards, depending on how you want to see this, are attempting to exert control on themselves, their, their environments, and their, their lives. And in some cases, the more senior the manager, the, the greater the need for control. There's been some really interesting um, research done on psychopathology. And it, it, it appears that um, senior managers in organizations are much more likely to be psychopaths than, than in the population as a whole, which is not surprising because they're driven and they, they're sort of clear and they're all, they're all the things that we want them to be, um, but some of the things we don't want them to be. So, so we're attempting in different ways to... Um, we spend a lot of energy trying to overcome fear and trying to control. And that energy could be focused in different ways, in more productive ways. I'll, I'll just quickly do this Deepak uh, Chopra, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with. It's just a quote, a quote from his sort of lifestyle guru and, and doctor and what have you. He says, everyone is faced with similar fears. Yet only those people who can't admit the threats hiding, hiding inside them, hiding inside themselves cope with them by resorting to control. A controlling person appears to be free from fear. That's the facade that control presents to the world. We put a high value on seeming to be in control of our lives, which further promotes the ego's belief that its controlling behavior is working. So there are traditional ways of controlling organizations that we, we all know well, um, which is reinforcing the hierarchies in, in the organization. So we focus on, on structures, protocols, roles, rather than working relationships. Um, at the extreme, this, this leads to, as we all experience, leads to managers hiding themselves away from different levels in the organizations. It becomes very siloed. Uh, often growing resentment amongst the, 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 those who consider themselves in the lower ranks, um, an us and them sort of organization, um, and an us against them. And it's a really interesting um, way in which we see off organizations often, because we see a sort of, there's the organization, there's me. But actually, the organization doesn't exist without the people. Um, if you took the people out of the organization, you would have a building. 
Um, so in that sense, we're all in it together. We all share the responsibility of success or failure in that organization and the different departments. Um, so we, we are the organization in a sense. Um, so what, one, one way of doing this, as I'm sure we're all familiar, is, is the traditional control often by yet another management change program, which, which effectively is another form of control because it's, it's trying to get everybody to think in the same way. So it's, it's, it's attempting, usually unsuccessfully, to implant um, a form of, of, of group think, if you like, in, in the organization, although it's, it's actually presented as something which is gonna help us all work together and more productively. Um, I want to, well, many, many companies are held in invisible prison. Red tape, rigid administration procedures and mushrooming regulation prevent any emergence of dynamism. And again, all of this is, is, uh, is very familiar, I'm sure. Um, then we get on to targets. I mean, targets are a really interesting area and one I'm fascinated with. Um, the government and different sectors have focused over 20 years or longer on targets. And the assumption there is that people need to be controlled or they'll run amok, that there'll be chaos if we don't make sure that there are strict guidelines about how people should behave and, and when. And we, we've all experienced them in the NHS, police, education, what have you. But often over-reliance on targets, and there are, I think there are ways of using targets and ways that aren't, but generally they start off well and they sort of disintegrate, in my experience, um, they can lead to very dis dysfunctional organizations and some horrendous unintended consequences. Um, for simple goals, targets sort of work fairly well. But in our current complex organizations, um, targets are really too simplistic for people to, to work effectively or to work effectively within them. So attempts to, pe to control people through targets are often fraught with difficulties. It doesn't stop us, doesn't stop us trying. Um, and just to give a very brief uh, summary of, of a situation you might have been familiar with, which is the Mid-Staffordshire NHS um, Foundation Trust. And there was a, there was a great um, a, a investigation carried out on there because what happened was that 400 people died at the hospital um, because the focus was on meeting the targets. The staff were so drilled to meet the targets that uh, customer, that, that patient care got lost in that process. And it's really hard to understand how that was possible, that people who were recruited and trained to work um, in hospitals and, and look after parents, uh, parents, maybe their parents, uh, patients, um, could have got so sort of off, off target in a sense that they became more interested or more focused on the, um, uh, you know, meeting the targets than they did on looking after their patients. Um, and I don't believe for a minute that they set out to do that. I think their intentions were very honorable. But the, the, the force of, of a target culture can be such that it, it really skews people's thinking um, to a large extent. So, in, and there are, some, there are some funnier ones. We did some work with the police force a while back and I shadowed this police sort of troops going around everywhere and we kicked down doors of drug raids and I helped carry the police dogs up the stairs and it was one of the most exciting projects. And um, at the end of it, I was chatting to one of the, the policemen I'd been, been shadowing and I said, tell me what's going on about drugs. He, I, said, I said, you keep telling me, everyone I speak to here seems to say, there are no drugs in Peterborough and laugh. I said, we've been on drug raids. I've been on drug raids. Clearly, there are drugs. And he said, oh, yes, he said, but um, uh, if we had drugs, we'd have a target. And if we had a target, we haven't hope in hell of meeting it. So the best thing is to say we haven't got drugs and everybody's happy. And that just struck me as a, as a it was a classic of how people are so ingenious. They can work their way around this stuff. And we did some stuff with a, a, um, a motor organization, sort of vehicle rescue. Um, organization. This was a long time ago in the sort of late 80s. And similar thing, we shadowed them and, you know, we helped them sort of with their jacks and stuff. Um, and uh, there was a, a, a new initiative as part of an advertising campaign which said, we will get you within the hour. Um, so their bonus was, was linked to it. 
the, the advertising campaigns support it. And, uh, but they couldn't always do it because sometimes they needed a tow truck, which took a long, long time to get there. So what they would do was, when they knew they needed a tow truck was to get a bike, um, a motorbike. So the, the, the cyclist got there, not cycling, motor, whatever it is, uh, got there within the hour. But of course, they knew very well that he wouldn't be able to deal with the problem. So the target was met, but the poor hapless um, driver had to wait for another hour for, uh, for some, some help. So targets are sort of a challenge in many organizations. How can we get around them and do what we need to do? Um, So all of this is leading to, well, you know, innovation doesn't thrive in this environment. We've created environments often which are counterproductive in terms of, of innovation, um, controlling by fear and, and, and inhibiting people rather than encouraging them. So what are the alternatives? Um, well, one of them is we have an awful lot of knowledge about how people are motivated, how they work. We have got huge amounts of stuff from psychology and sociology and anthropology and history, which very clearly indicate the conditions that encourage um, human happiness and, and productivity. So I'm back where Wayne sort of left off here. Um, we say we want to be happy and we want fulfillment at work. So why don't we put this learning in practice? Because actually being happy at work is very strongly linked to productivity. And there have been loads of studies that show that. So why are we making people miserable uh, and actually, at the same time, not even achieving the goal of innovation, is, which is what we claim we want. Now, this sounds terribly um, idealistic in the current climate, but you know, we have to think counterintuitively. It hasn't worked, has it? We're hunkering down, driven by fear, holding back. It hasn't achieved what we want to achieve. Fear is paralyzing the workforce. Um, and by the time we get around to doing something different, we'll have missed the boat um, in terms of, of, of innovation. So I think we've got to be a bit braver, really. Um, I don't know about you, but I was quite transfixed by the Gareth Malone Choir um, programs. I'm sure some of you would have seen them. And I found that quite extraordinary that he had managed to, to mobilize and motivate and enthuse a group of people who were fairly disparate and a bit sort of, you know, indifferent about whether the, their work often um, and he, he did it by the force of his, his personality and by unleashing something in themselves, which wasn't to do with work, but actually fed into work. And I think that, that to me is a really interesting area, that we, we have people that are whole people, and as a, work, as, as, as a worker, we, we put them in a little sort of cardboard box. Um, if we can unleash that and... and encourage the connections, encourage their, their abilities, I think we have a much better chance of, of, uh, uh, of innovation, of, of developing genuine innovation than we would when we would otherwise. Oops, get rid of that one. Um, and organizations are not just hierarchies. They're also organic and they're systemic. We are the organization. We are all responsible. And it's also a network of relationships. I mean, you can see, you know, there's those charts where it goes down, and here's the senior bloke who goes down to all of us little minions at the bottom. Uh, another way of, of looking at organizations is that network of relationships. And those relationships can cut across hierarchies. They can, they can link by um, interests or need or association or, or whatever. So we need both, a balance of hierarchy, but also that sense of the hive, if you like, is how I tend to see it, where people are constantly moving and making connections where it's useful. So we need a balance of both, really, somewhere between a sort of military dictatorship and a flash mob, I guess. Um, but where there is trust, um, organizations can weather the storm. And again, I think you know, trust it can be all sorts of different things, which I won't go into here. But just to give an example, um, John Lewis recently, or a year or two ago, had to implement a, a, a restructuring program that meant a lot of redundancies, which for John Lewis was quite radical because it isn't part of their culture. Um, but what they did was to work very cooperatively together. They had a restructuring scheme. They did have redundancies. 
Um, but they deliberately involved the staff in, in conversations about how it would be, um, how it would be monitored, how it would, would be affected. And as a result of that, they ended up um, with a greater score on their trust uh, criteria than they, they had before they started that process. So it isn't necessary, it isn't automatically that organizations where there's, there's difficulty and where there has to be redundancies end up feeling more um, frightened or more fearful. It doesn't necessarily have to be. I mean, John Lewis had the advantage of having a huge sort of um, uh, body of trust there before they started. But it, it's saying that we, we can do things which are perhaps brutal in an organization, but do it in such a way that the staff are part of that process. Um, so it, it can enhance trust. I mean, there's, there's a nice Sufi saying, which is, um, trust in, in God, but tie up your camel. So I think it's, it's a mixture of, of, of uh, yes, we have to trust, but you have to be a bit sort of uh, um, discerning as well. So, yeah, as a hierarchical, as well as hierarchical structure, this, this network of connections seems to me a very, very powerful area to, to develop. And I think in, as we move on, that, that the, the, the power of that hierarchical structure in organization seems to me constantly under threat. Um, it's not possible, perhaps it never was, for a senior manager to know what was happening in the whole organization. Um, now it's impossible. There are all sorts of groups of people and different things working virally or virtually or whatever. Um, we have to accept that, that, that the net or the, the, um, the hive will, will grow in importance as a, as a, a form of organizational structure. Um, so the, 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 the chats around the, the water cooler, the rumor machine, the corridor communications, um, these things are all very important. Not, they're not just a, a way of passing time and, and can strengthen or weaken the organization. So it feels that we need to, to talk, um, tap into that hive culture more, that um, often employees themselves are very clear about what needs to be done in their area of, of, of uh, influence. Um, we, we think of innovation as this great big thing, whereas actually innovation can often be very small steps within uh, a confined department or, or whatever. It's, it's a mindset that needs to grow within the entire organization. Very briefly, just to... to uh, where have we gone? Things have gone in different orders now. That one. Um, we recently carried out a consultancy project with some senior managers in an NHS trust, um, and they were in a real state. Uh, they were trying to um, maintain their, their client, um, their targets, but at the same time deal with, with, with clients. So it felt like they had two jobs that they were doing separately. One was meeting targets, and the other was, was doing their, what they regarded as their real work. So they were extremely stressed under... They felt undervalued, anxious, fearful, great workloads. And we implemented a, a program which lasted a year and involved them being there for, t I think, two to three days a month. Um, and initially, they all resisted and said, we haven't got the time. And the CEO said, you're doing it, whether you like it or not. So they did. And the intention was to, to develop this hive culture, to, to build relationships. They were in different sites. Uh, they didn't talk to each other very much, uh, these, these different sites, and they felt sort of... Um, wary of each other. Um, I'll just skip to the end of it, really, rather than, than the, 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 the body of it. But what happened in the end, because they, they formed little learning groups and they decided who they were going to be with and, and who work with. But the end result was that the managers felt less stressed um, and better able to manage both the clients and the targets. So they'd become more efficient in how they worked. And the way that they did this was to know who to contact within the organization that could support them or help them. So they, they developed their own structure, which wasn't there before, um, and it seemed to, to, to do the job. I mean, to the extent that six months after the project finished, those, those learning groups that they'd set up at the time were still operating, and they were still using them as an important resource. So you know, putting, putting effort into building trust and relationships in an organization isn't sort of airy-fairy stuff. It, it does impact on the, on the bottom line as well. So feeling passionate, it's not rocket science. Happy employees are more productive, more, more secure. Um, and if we want successful innovation, we have to somehow foster a climate that encourages innovation. 
um, as a um, Reinhard Springer, who is a, a management guru, put it, creative work is fragile and uncertain. Ideas have to be developed, proposed, tested, and justified or abandoned. People engage in such a process only when they feel secure in an atmosphere of trust, respect, and goodwill. Trust makes it easier to cope uh, with deviations from routines and rules, especially when innovations and experiments end in failure. So innovation is, is hard work. It's not just good ideas. It obviously needs discipline, and we need to invest to, to allow people to think, think outside the box, the dreadful phrase, um, and support failure. I think we're too, too focused on, on success in innovation. Um, one out of 10 um, ideas in marketing fail. Now, interestingly, that hasn't changed since the 1970s. But if we accept that that's how we learn, that's OK. If we say, oh, it's failed, we better not do it again, then you know, we never achieve very much, really, do we? Um, so diversity is the other thing. We, we, the, with fear becomes the tendency to sort of close in and not, as I said, not stick your head above the parapet, think like everybody else does. Um, but we need diversity for, for creativity, for new ideas. There's just too much groupthink in organizations, and the more frightened we are, the more groupthink we have. Um, we need to challenge ourselves and challenge each other in a greater way without it feeling threatening. So we need dogs with short legs and dogs with long legs and everything in between, really. Um, and it's odd, because we tend to think of ourselves as free spirits, don't we? I mean, we, nobody likes to think that they're sort of, you know, like everybody else. Um, so, but in reality, we're, we're herd creatures. Um, to innovate successfully, we have to have more diverse inputs. Um, we have to work on that because diversity fosters, fosters innovation. Now, if you don't believe this, <laughs> that you're a herd creature, um, let me show you a clip from Candid Camera. And, and some of you will remember this if you're sort of rather <sighs> go back some way, shall we say. Um, and then I'll ask you again, but don't take this literally. This is an, an illustration. It's not supposed to be um, a scientific experiment. Right, now hopefully I can do this without... Mm. I need help. It's gone. Where is it? Oh, there, is that it? Uh, yeah, just click in the middle. Oh, okay. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff, will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use... Let's see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. Notice, notice they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. It's good fun, isn't it? So not to be taken too literally, but um, I think it's just trying to illustrate the fact we do, we, 
think, think we're individual, but actually um, we're much more uh, uh, herd creatures than we think. Um, I need to move on fairly quickly. So um, in terms of, uh, I'm not saying that we don't need leaders. Leaders are, are, are necessary, but actually leadership is perhaps the more relevant characteristic now, that we need leaders in different organizations, in different, different parts of the organization, um, and find, actually finding the people who influence, influence Influencers? Yes, influencers. Um, is important. The people who will mobilize the group around them um, to, 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 yes. Um, oh, quick point on innovation. That we do th tend to think of it as, as big. It can be the sum of the parts. Do you recognize this chap? Dave Brailsford. He's um, uh, the British Cycling Performance Director. And it's interesting what he says about, about innovations. He said the whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike, then improved it by 1%, you'll get a significant increase when you put it all back together again. And that's interesting in terms of our view of innovation, because we do quite often are quite daunted by the sort of the big word of innovation. And he was just saying, yeah, I'm going to sort of methodically go through the elements that could be changed. Um, innovate. Oops, I'll move on from that one. So one in 10 experiments fails. We need to accept it and learn, as I was saying earlier. Uh, the Google approach is 10 or 20% of the time is spent on, um, on experiments, really, things they wanted to try off the bat that might sort of materialize into something that might not. Encouraging staff to initiate projects, doing small projects throughout the organization so it becomes part of the thinking as opposed to a thing to do. Circulating work groups, this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> getting people to use their skills that they might be using outside the organization in there. And we do need time to think. Um, creativity comes when we have different ideas colliding quite often. Um, that, and that sometimes produces new thoughts, new ideas. But if we don't have time to think, it's very hard to do that. And very rarely in most organizational life do we have time to think. And I, that seems to be something we have to make some more space for. Hmm. Interesting. There's a bit missing there. We... Never mind, there's a clip missing. I think it's... Sorry? Do you need the slide, the video? Uh, yeah, the second one, is it? Oh, don't, don't worry, I'll sort of... No, don't, don't worry, we'll, we'll. Um, Yeah, so not to be forgotten. Um, I've been talking very much about organizations themselves, but what about the input from, from research, particularly good qualitative research? And I think this is an area that's been a bit neglected in recent years, because people think, oh, God, the cost of, the cost of research is, is so high. Um, but the, what can come back from it is enormous. Um, and I think we cut research budgets at our peril. Um, a hugely sort of, uh, can be hugely productive, particularly when they're, they're in this sort of very creative uh, um, forum. This, this was a day-long workshop that we ran with people from 17 to 70 about what they wanted out of their lives. And it was a fascinating day, which, which um, it was actually for an insurance company, as it turned out, but it, it gave them all sorts of uh, insights into how they might restructure the organization to fit in with the way in which their customers uh, wanted to, to understand insurance. So it was a very valuable exercise for them. It was just another one of the, the drawings about where my life is in the future. Um, so we're, we're working at, at the creative edge in, in terms of um, uh, complexity sciences. The, the, um, the creative edge, which is between stability and chaos, is where most of creativity is, uh, uh, supposedly happens. Um, and perhaps that's where we should be concentrating. Oops. That's my last bit. Hmm. So Einstein's view was the mere formulation of a problem is far more essential than its solution, which may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental skills. To raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination and marks real advances in science. 
Oh, I've lost my last sheet. So just to, to sum up there, really, I mean, a few key points that I've been talking around, and I'll whisk through them fairly slow, you know, slowly, fairly fastly, even quickly. Um, working hard on building trust seems to me a, a critical area as a, as a starting point from innovation. Um, learning to adapt and to reduce fear through that, fostering a hive, hive culture within organisations, and ma maintaining that balance between hierarchy and, and the hive culture. Um, encouraging more dissent, diversity, more challenge. I think that is one of the areas that we sort of have lost uh, over the last few years. Uh, being clear why we want to innovate. There's, there's often a sort of, we have to innovate. Um, actually questioning why you want to do it and what you want to choose, uh, what you're going to get out of it seems to me to be terribly important. Giving people the resources and the time to experiment in, in small local teams. Um, encouraging um, trial and error, uh, learning from failure. Um, don't overdo the, the performance monitoring. I think we have to look at ways of sort of trying to, to put that to one side, that targets are, are really, on the whole, not terribly effective for most of the things we're doing in complex organisations. Um, identifying the influencers and getting them on side, the people in different organisations. And I think, remember Maslow. Um, people need to feel needed to contribute and to grow, and happy, involved employees are more productive. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.